fun. So, Jason, come on up. We're looking forward to uh, what you got for us. Thank you, buddy. All right. Hey, good to see you guys. So when I was living in Washington, D.C., I was a chaplain at Arlington National Cemetery. And, of course, the Army can only do things at totally inconvenient hours. So we had a staff meeting that had to meet at 5 a.m., so I had to get up at around 4 in order to be at my staff meeting at 5 so that we could start the real work at 9. And when I got up and I was running around doing all the stuff I needed to do, um, I'm pulling out of the driveway and it occurred to me, we, we had a little baby, you know, my little baby is now this tall, right? But um, our little, I didn't see my wife in the bedroom when I was getting ready and leaving. And so when I was stopped at a stop sign, I sent her a text message saying, hi, sweetie, um, you weren't in bed when I got up this morning. Like, are you feeding the baby or, you know? Um, but I didn't say that. I just said, you weren't in bed when I got up this morning, question mark, question mark. So I go into work, go in my staff meeting, and uh, I get a text message back, and I look down at it, and it says, ha, 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 I'm like, ha, ha, ha. She <laughs> I didn't text my wife. <laughs> I had... <laughs> I had a special forces hunting buddy named Bill. <laughs> his wife and my wife are good friends, and her, his wife, Dawn, had been texting me, asking me about how to surprise my wife about something. So I texted Dawn that I didn't see her this morning, right? So I immediately pull my man card out, call Bill, like, hey. He's like, yes. <laughs> like, oh, you already heard. He's like, heard what? <laughs> plays out. We got a good laugh about it, right? But communication's hard, right? And it's even harder when you're sending the wrong text messages to other people. I've got um, three kids, two teenage daughters that are in um, the high school area here, and I love to manipulate language with them. Like my youngest, Clara, will often say, I have a friend, insert boy's name. And I'm like, oh, do you, do you love your bo that boy? And she goes, well, he's my friend, dad. I'm like, oh, so you don't, you don't love your friends. We're called to even love our enemies, <laughs> like, right? right? And it just, she knows at this point there is no right answer, right? That I'm just going to twist and manipulate whatever she says to try to make her embarrassed. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun. But it's not fun. Okay, the quick one. Um, it's not fun when people are taking scripture and manipulating scripture to try to deceive you and try to deceive other people, right? And have you heard people say that you can take the Bible and make it mean anything you want it to, okay? That's not true. You can take parts of the Bible, you can take verses out of context, you can manipulate things that were said to try to accomplish your own message, right? It's important to understand as Christians why that can't happen, how to understand those difficult passages and, and understand the methodology to be able to figure out what truth actually is. Are you with me so far? Okay. So I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin in communication. Okay. I'm going to totally geek out on you this evening. And instead of preaching, we're going to go to class. Okay. If those of you who didn't like school you know, are a little nervous about me using big words, don't worry, okay? First of all, I'm going to give all of that information away to you free, no charge, all right? <laughs> so no tuition bills. Secondly, you never had me for a professor, all right? We're going to make this fun. Um, if you have a question or if I make eye contact and you're just totally confused, just do this, all right? And, uh, and I'll try to back up a little bit so we go along. With that being said, We've got about 20 minutes to cover at least three years' worth of content, okay? So big, broad brushstrokes. But what I want to equip you with today is how to uncover truth in the Bible and avoid deception. Sound good? All right, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. I am so glad that you are the way, that you are the truth, and that you are life, and that you promise that you will reveal yourself to us in your word. Help us use um, our minds today to fully worship you, to inform our hearts and to inform our neighbors about your great love and forgiveness so that we might follow you all the days of our life. In your name I pray. Amen. 
Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> I have these two out of order. Okay. Here, first thing that before we get into language interpretation and communication, it's really under, important to understand what language is. All right? So first of all, we have to understand that language is symbolic. Make sense? So what's this? A what? All right, careful. Some people are allergic in here. You don't want to get anybody too excited. But that's, that's, not, that's not actually a bee, is it? It's a squiggly line in the shape of something that we call the letter B, right? And this is, is a, a U shape, and this is a G, and those are three symbols that we put together that correlate with symbolic sounds that we associate with those symbols, correct? And then we get a word, which is bug, Okay, now the problem with language and symbols is language is polyvalent, which means that it has multiple meanings and multiple forms. In other words, these are three different forms, correct? These symbols um, are all three different fonts. We could have them lowercase, uppercase, but we would still understand what they mean and asserted together, they would still say bug. bug. Absolutely. So you following me so far? Great. Um, so multiple forms, multiple meanings. Language is subjective, okay? So in other words, context is really important because bug can have a lot of different meanings, okay? We're going to get into those in a second. But there's these guys named Sapir and Worf who have a hypothesis that was really important, they thought was important in the 90s, which meant that no, because language is subjective and polyvalent, you can't ever understand anything anybody is saying because we all bring only our own meaning to whatever literature we're reading and whatever conversation that we're having, okay? That's absolute garbage, unless you're married. <laughs> then, 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 then you absolutely have no idea what's going on at any point. No, but really, what, what's that called is linguistic relativity and postmodernism, which says that language has to precede thought, that you don't have the ability to think unless you have language, and only your language can determine the left and right limits of what you can think, okay? It's garbage. We can understand what other people are saying. It's difficult in marriage, probably the most difficult, but we actually can do it. Okay, so what we're going to emphasize here is what's really true, which are language universals. That language has meaning, words mean things, and language can be known. So what is communication? Communication is interpretation, and communication is defined, and interpretation is defined as shared meaning. Are you with me so far? We're not communicating, or we're not interpreting until we're sharing meaning. So if I'm talking about a bug, it's really important to understand the context of what I'm talking about because a bug can be a car or insect or a virus, a secret listening device, um, software malfunction, a glip, glitch, irritation, right? You're bugging me. Okay. What, what am I missing? Anything else? No. What, what's that? Your kids? Oh, really? Oh, it's a nickname. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we could go on and on and on. But when I'm talking about a Volkswagen Beetle and I'm getting slugged by one of my kids, right? I know why they're slugging me, right? You know, I'm not just applying my own hypothetical meaning to why I'm getting punched by a 13-year-old girl that's giggling, right? <laughs> Like, I know what's going on, and even though all of this theory is coming together and people say that you can't, Saphir and Worf will say that you can't ever understand anything, therefore we couldn't ever understand the Bible, right, or anything anybody else says, it's not really true. So I want to get that out of the way first before we jump into how we understand what is true. To oversimplify it, it's context. You tracking with me, Blaze? Context. Context is, you could say it's king, okay? It's absolutely critical, and there's a whole bunch of contexts that we have to remember and keep in mind when we're looking at language. So first, the language context. Raise your hand if you realize that the Bible wasn't written in English. You know that? 
written predominantly in Hebrew, and then in Greek and in Aramaic. Believe it or not, there are some people that believe it was written in Old English. <laughs> and they only read the Old King James Bible. I'm not kidding you. There are people that say, if it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay? And I'm like, well, he kind of wrote in Greek, so... It's important to be aware of that. People are very confused. So we need to understand the language context because it brings out great meaning in things that we're talking about. So when you look at the story of Abraham and Sarah, and, she's, and they're promised a son, and she laughs because she's old and can't have kids, and that's all of her hopes and dreams. And then their son is born, and they name him the Hebrew name Isaac to know that his name means laughter is critical to the story because God's getting the last laugh that in the face of impossibility that we can all laugh because of the example of Isaac, right? And then there's cultural context. And we have to remember that in Bible, the Bible that we're looking through the lens of ancient Near Eastern societies. So any of you recall the story in Luke 10 where Mary and Martha are hosting for Jesus? Okay, Martha is running around getting all things together, playing hostess, right? And, and she's really stressed out because sitting at Jesus' feet is who? Mary, right? And I have seen and heard a hundred pastors or so talk about the great moral of this story being Martha being worried about being too busy and all the housework that needs to be done and being upset that her sister wasn't pulling her weight, okay? That she was sloughing off. But that's not what's going on at all. See, Mary's, I mean, Martha's walking in the door here, and she's seeing her sister, who is a woman, sitting in a men's only section of where the disciples of Jesus are, and there's no such thing as a woman disciple, so what is she doing, Jesus? See, the subcontext in that conversation is she needs to get back to doing women's work. Put her in her lane so that we are not shamed. And Jesus, being the first one in Israel to have female disciples, says, no, what she is doing is good. So now we have total liberty to do gender bending when, on whatever we think, right? Right? No, no, we don't. And that's what's happening in our society right now, right? We see corrections being made in scripture and then taking things to one extreme or the other instead of pursuing the nuanced truth. So it's, there's a whole lot, there's a huge difference between saying it's all right for men to be in women's sports and cheat versus it's okay for women to go to school and be disciples of Jesus, right? Like there's, there's a real difference there that we can get into and we shouldn't correlate those things out of context. But that's what's going on. The, the cultural reader, when they see that story, in Eastern eyes would have seen first, Mary's using the wrong gender area. Like you ever have a friend walk into the wrong bathroom, right? You're like, yeah, don't do that, all right? That's what Martha is saying, and that's really important. The historical and cultural kind of overlap sometimes. Like in the culture, you guys are familiar with Jesus when he said in John 14, I am the way, I am the, and I am the life, right? Those are very neat things because he's the path that we should follow, right? That Jesus' truth is neat because he is, he's, He's the creator of all things, that he is life. He's the very source of life, right? And that's where most of our Western understanding stops. But if you'd understand the Hebrew culture and you went to worship at the temple, you would understand that there are various gates to areas that you can worship. And the further you go in closer to the Holy of Holies, the closer you get to God the Father in the, the most holy place. And there are doors going to each one of those more sacred places, the doors are named the way, the truth, the life. And what, so what Jesus is saying is he's call, recalling these portions of their lives in the temple and saying, 
I am the only way to the Father. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Holy of Holies except through me. They would see that because they walked through or they were very familiar with those gates. See how this changes the meaning and makes it come alive for all of us? We have authorial context, like who wrote this context. It's really important to understand. Moses wrote Genesis, but it's also under, important to understand that within the historical context of his writing, that the way Moses wrote historical narrative is completely different than how we do journalistic narratives or historical writing today. Tracking me with me? In other words, when G Moses was writing Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, he had no interest in answering most of the questions that we have about creation in the 21st century. So before we try to apply those questions and try to seek those answers out of a text that was never intended to answer those questions, we have to pause and ask what is the context and the meaning of what Moses was intending, all right? So again, context is, Blaze? Author authoritarial, yeah, it's all these things, right? Context is king. In, in, I would have not said critical, I would have said king, right? But, all right, and then genre. It really is important to know what kind of literature you're reading, right? If you're reading history or if you're reading poetry, different interpretations happen depending on what you do. Like you are going to, ah, oh, let's see, what would I use? The scripture's on the tip of my tongue where the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Love that verse, okay? But you're never going to see me lick my Bible, <laughs> okay? Well, I might pretend to if it's one of my kids, right? You know, like I've got girls, I love to tease them. Anyway, but you know that though this metaphor is there not to mean that we're literally supposed to be tasting the scripture, right? And so how we understand history and poetry and narrative or prophetic and apocalyptic literature influences our interpretation. And so we have to bear that in mind. And that's why I get frustrated. As Brian just learned this week that um, I, I play guitar and I sing. Um, I've even done a little bit of songwriting. And so when people take songs that I like in Christian music and decide to attack them because they're really uncomfortable with, for instance, um, God's reckless love, you know, people are divided on this song and you can love me or hate me for saying this, right? But it's metaphor. Just like you're not going to see me telling you that the psalmist is encouraging you to lick your Bible and taste and see that God is good, right? The songwriter, when he's talking about God's reckless love, isn't exactly saying that God is reckless as much as, as the psalmist would be saying that God has hands or he actually has feet or that the sun moves across the sky, right? That's a metaphor too, right? We know that the earth spins on its axis, right? But that's not poetic language, so to say from our perspective, wow, God, that looks really reckless to me, and I can praise you because I have limited language, is okay, all right? So, and then here, this is where we're going to do most of our work. We need to do intra-textual intra context and interpretation, which means what is the message of the passage actually within the argument and within the book that you're talking about? Okay, before I preach on any one of the Gospels or most of the books of the New Testament, if I'm preparing to preach, I will sit down and I will read the entire Gospel all the way through. It takes only about an hour to read any of the four Gospels because it was delivered and it was intended to be delivered all at once. And so it's only through that entire context of the Gospel that you really get the intratextual context of what the author is saying within that book. Make sense? Okay. The intertextual context is, how does this fit in the entire Bible? We have 66 books written by over 40 authors, right? Over 1,500 years, and they're 
the way God has constructed this is a miracle in and of itself that it parallels each other. But Scripture should always be used to interpret Scripture when things aren't exactly clear. Okay? And then finally, we need to understand our, our own context as the reader. What bias or blindness do we bring to the passage? Right? David proclaims that his best friend Jonathan and he had a love that surpassed even the love of women. Okay? Which I have heard dozens of times in recent years to mean that David was obviously in a romantic relationship with Jonathan. No. No, he was not. And neither was Jesus and John. Right? And we can tell that because of intra and intertextual passages. You know, this might be a surprise to you, but David really liked girls. Okay? <laughs> and he passed that on to Solomon. Okay, he may have had issues, but like in Jonathan, too much was not one of them. Okay, so, and this is how we know throughout other scriptures that we can find out what the truth actually is. Are you tracking with me so far? Awesome. All right. So, this is the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis means to call out or to draw out of. This is what we want to be doing when we look at Scripture. Eisegesis is when we put our own ideas into Scripture, okay? The relationship with David and Jonathan was a perfect example of eisegesis. Somebody had a, had a, um, an agenda and an angle that they wanted to substantiate with the Scripture, and so they added their idea to that story, Okay? but we're not drawing the meaning of what the author originally intended out of that story. And so biblical translators try to draw out the story into English, our language, or for some of us, Spanish. If you speak more than one language, you get this a lot more than um, English speakers, okay? Who, who are my multilingual friends out here? Okay, lots? Okay, great. When I was living in Italy, um, people used to ask me all the time, um, what do you call somebody who is bilingual? I mean, what do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Bilingual, right? What do you call somebody who speaks three languages? Tri what do you call someone who speaks one language? American. <laughs> okay, so, so for us Americans, it's happening. Bible translations happen in paraphrasing or an idea-by-idea -idea translation or an attempted word-by-word although that's kind of difficult. But here's what I want to get to. The Bible can never mean what it's never meant. Okay? So how do we unlock the Scripture? Before we ask how this Scripture applies to us, we must first discern what it meant to the author and the original audience. My most hated question, what does this verse mean to you? You ever go to a Bible study and listen to somebody say that? Nobody cares what this verse means to you. What you should only care about is what this verse means to Brian. No, just kidding. <laughs> Brian's getting nervous. He's like, whoa, you're never talking again. <laughs> right? We want to know first what, what this verse meant by the original author to the original audience. And then, once we've gathered that through all the context we've talked about, apply it to what, how it affects us, right? So that, but now people usually mean, how does this apply to you? That's a great question, right? But that's what exegesis is. Once we understand the original author's intent to the original audience, then we can apply it to us, okay? So... One of the scriptures that people get stumped on all the time is why Paul makes a big deal about women wearing makeup. All right, who are my women wearing makeup? Sinners, right? <laughs> now, okay, the, the deal there with the original audience was who are the only women wearing makeup in Paul's time, right? So do you think Paul's having a problem with you ladies here tonight? Or is he really saying, ladies, it's really not a good look to show up to church looking like a prostitute, Right? Right? And, th and that, in, is simplistically, is what we're doing with biblical eisegesis. So here's a practical exercise. Matthew 5.39 says, But 
I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him other, turn to them the other cheek also. So Brian's going to demonstrate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was just wondering if you had the courage to get up here, right? Like, which one's, which one's doing the slapping, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. <laughs> which did you have in mind? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, when you're first reading that, there's something that should stand out to you, right? There's something before this, right? Like, one of these days, I'm going to write a book called The Big Butts in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> You sang the song, didn't you? And like in your head, just a little bit. I like, no, anyway. So <laughs> there's other words too that say therefore. And whenever you run across therefore, you should go back just like but and see what it's there for. So within this context of this verse, this says, uh, but we'll back up. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Hmm, footnote. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So this is something that we know is happening within even greater work, okay? And so if we go into those greater works in Exodus and then Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we're not going to get into all of it because it's 801. We're going to find out that these are legal guidance, guidelines for the people of how to justly administer law. So we'll take this one. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. Okay? Now, if anybody hits my wife, what is my inclination going to be? Well, let's be honest. What is it? Kill him. <laughs> let's not mince words. Okay? My inclination is going to be to kill them because they hit my wife. Now, what the law is saying here, uh, Levitical law is saying, eh, Jason, that's the way of the world. That's how things used to work. My ways are better. This is how you should, this is what is just. If there is serious injury, then you take life for life. By the way, it's talking about a pregnant woman, so even unborn babies' lives mattered to God back in Leviticus, and it was murder then, just in case anybody was wondering. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise, okay? What they're saying is be equitable in the administration of justice as a legal system, okay? Which is different. If anyone takes the life of a human being, be put to death, right? Again, life for life. Restitution, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The problem was is that in Jesus' day, people were using this to justify the maximum amount of vengeance they could take out on anybody that they could get away with. So if you stepped on my toe, Lord knows I'm going to step on your toe, <laughs> right? Now, God's not going to let me kill you, but I'm going to smash that toe, all right? So, so what we see here, and we're wrapping up, is that this principle of retributive justice as seen in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy was intended to limit retaliation and ensure that punishment fit the crime. But that was different than the context that what Jesus was talking about with a grave insult. Hold that in mind. Jesus' counter teaching is non-retaliatory responses to personal offenses. We're not talking about how to run the legal system, right? That would cause everything to buckle, right? If we suddenly stopped prosecuting people for theft and prosecuting people for murder and... Wait a second. That sounds familiar. All right, I'll stop being, I'll stop being political. I'm really not trying to be. Um, too much. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um, like, so Matthew 5 is part of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus is challenging the conventional ideas versus the spirit of what God's heart is, and where Jesus is emphasizing love and mercy and forgiveness over strict justice and retribution. In other words, loving your enemies, giving those to ask, going the extra mile. 
in ancient Near Eastern contexts, being slapped on the right cheek typically implies a backhanded slap or a deep insult rather than a physically harmful act. Jesus' audience would have understood that this is a call to forego personal vengeance and instead exhibit an unexpected and gracious response to offenses. So, I've seen people take Matthew 5.39 and use it as the guiding principle for pacifism, that we should never go to war, we should never defend ourselves, we should never um, resist an evil person. So if somebody breaks into my house tonight and they want to rape and kill my family, I shouldn't resist them. Is that what Scripture is saying here? Or is it completely different? Yes. Okay? Now... There's a time in Luke 22 where Jesus tells his disciples to go buy a sword, okay? And I've seen that just recently. Man, it was, it was a website called Gunslingers for Jesus. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay, all right, look. I'm in the army, okay? So, so and although I'm a non-combatant, I wasn't always. And, you know, marksmanship is one of my favorite activities in sports. Now, that's, and as a chaplain, I, I deal a lot with just war and um, all that stuff. But the, the bottom line is, is Jesus is not telling us to go raise up an army like Muhammad did. Muhammad clearly uh, advocated um, force, you know, in order to change people's lives and ways of living. And Jesus advocated for grace and love to do that and that, to convert people's hearts that way. Um, Conversion by the sword has never been Jesus' um, motive. But it's, it's important that we understand and have the ability to take the truth because it can be nuanced. So this doesn't imply pacifism or condoning injustice, but rather choosing a higher path of love and mercy. By turning the other G cheek, Jesus advocates for breaking the cycle of violence and showing a radical form of love that mirrors God's character when you're offended. And that's how we kind of navigate all of those principles. We went really fast. But do you think you're tracking? Now, one of these days we'll slow down and we can take these things verse by verse. But just so you know, all of these eight things, all of these eight various different contexts is what Brian is using behind the scenes when he's breaking down for you what the meaning of these difficult passages in Scripture is. He's taking them step by step by step, first understanding what the original author meant to the original audience, understanding that principle, and then applying it to Calvary Marietta so that we can follow Jesus and not be manipulated by people who pick and choose which verses that they want to follow. You see how that's different than following the entire message and the entire body of scripture? Awesome. All right, it has been a pleasure to whip through all of this for you. It's my hope, really, that you'll use these to uncover d the deep truths of Scripture and not be manipulated by the media, not be manipulated by your neighbors, and really stand confidently on God's Word as you move forward out into the community. Love you guys. Let's pray. Mm. Jesus, thank you for giving us these tools. And thank you for giving us a word that we can understand and share with others. You deserve all of our praise and we love you. Um, in your name we pray, amen. amen.